after my financial appeal is all.
Good afternoon and evening to everyone joining us across the country for this town hall to discuss what's next for Bernie supporters and continuing the fight for the political revolution. Before we get started, I encourage everyone watching right now to sign in using the sign in form link that should appear on screen. Our organizers will also post this under our Facebook event description and in the comments for whatever feed you're watching. We'll hear more about concrete next steps for our movement, but it's absolutely critical that we continue to build it by organizing and connecting our struggles. We wanna be able to stay in touch after this event so that we can connect you with tenants, organizing for rent and utility cancellations, with workers in your region or industry fighting for health and safety measures, and with other socialists determined to take the fight for reforms further to fundamentally challenge capitalism and transform our society. My name is Alicia Salvadeo. I'm a high school teacher and a Pennsylvania delegate on the ballot for Bernie Sanders, and I was a volunteer organizer for the campaign. I'm excited to be your MC and facilitate tonight's awesome panel of socialists, uh, progressive activists, as well as labor and student organizers. Bernie Sanders' historic 2020 campaign brought together a diverse and energetic movement to fight corporate greed for a bold working class program. To many of us, the stark reality of vast inequality under capitalism was already clear, not to mention the exist existential threat of climate change. The coronavirus has triggered the public health and economic disasters we now face, and capitalism continues to magnify the havoc of the pandemic, putting profit before our very lives and livelihoods. Corporations have been bailed out first and foremost, while the government cuts meager checks that have yet to reach everyone else, as tens of millions face layoffs, lose their health care coverage, and struggle to afford rent. The Democrats' new $3 trillion HEROES Act, meanwhile, leaves out progressive measures to cover lost wages or set up monthly stimulus checks for $2,000, but it manages to grant protections to the health insurance industry. Workers have also had no say regarding when we might safely return to work and under what conditions. The decision to reopen the economy has been made instead by billionaires like Trump, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Now more than ever, do we need a real political revolution to decisively take on the capitalist class? Last month, Bernie made the unfortunate mistake of dropping out of the presidential race and is now supporting a weak centrist opponent to take on Trump and a party that has done everything to stop our working class movement. We saw the democratic establishment effectively steal this primary from us bending the rules to welcome the billionaire Bloomberg into the race and orchestrating the withdrawal of Buttigieg and Klobuchar ahead of Super Tuesday to consolidate support behind Joe Biden. Even Elizabeth Warren's silence after dropping out was a deafening capitulation to the corporate party line. While Bernie and his delegates remain on the ballot, the undemocratic maneuvering of the Democratic Party continues to suppress the Democratic Agency of Working People, as in New York, where they recently attempted to cancel the presidential primary altogether. Millions are desperate to drive Trump out of office, but many also feel rightfully ambivalent towards this nominal choice between him and the neoliberal policies that gave rise to his brand of right-wing populism. Joe Biden is a through and through corporate Democrat who, like Trump, has prided himself on cuts to social services and has presided over tax breaks for the rich. Like Trump, he has no plan to address the economic and healthcare crises. And as a member of the Obama administration, he oversaw another bailout of Wall Street after the 2008 recession. Like Trump, Biden also faces serious sexual assault allegations, and this calls into question the Democratic Party's seriousness in taking on widespread oppression and holding its own leadership accountable. This puts our movement at a crossroads, and not for the first time. Bernie may have dropped out of the race, but his campaign's bold platform to take on the billionaires and the prevailing spirit of not me us have left a deep impression on workers and young people across this country. 
In the absence of real plans for relief from the two-party corporate establishment, it's up to us to take up the fight for pandemic relief and mass testing and to go on the offensive to tax the rich to pay for this crisis, as well as for Medicare for All, a Green New Deal to address mass unemployment and crumbling infrastructure, and so much more. Tonight, our panel will address the gamut of burning questions many of us have about the way forward. Should Bernie supporters vote for Joe Biden? How can Bernie activists continue to organize in our workplaces, schools, and communities, and even under current social distancing measures? How do we effectively unite these struggles and set them on a common path to a new party for working and young people? So let's meet the panel who will take up these questions. First, we'll hear from Socialist Alternative and Seattle City Council member Shama Sawant. We'll also hear from Tyler Vassar, a postal worker in Minneapolis and a labor for Bernie organizer, followed by Rebecca Robins, an undergraduate and lead organizer of Students for Bernie in Pittsburgh. Unfortunately, we had a last minute cancellation and will not be joined by Benjamin Dixon, who is a progressive activist, author, and North Star host of the Benjamin Dixon podcast. He sends his apologies and we apologize to folks who are excited to hear him. After we hear from our panelists, we'll open up to questions submitted by the audience. If you have a question for any or all of our speakers or about how you can join the continued fight back, against the billionaire class, please find the thread on Facebook um, on the event page and post your questions there or else post on the live YouTube feed in the comments and our organizers will pass those questions on to me. So now I'd like to turn to Shama who was elected in 2013 as the first independent socialist to win a major office in decades. By combining unapologetic working class politics and the power of social movements, Within six months of her election, Seattle became the first US city to pass a $15 an hour minimum wage. Since then, she's led the way on passing Indigenous Peoples Day, landmark renters' rights, and police accountability measures. Most recently, she spearheaded efforts to tax Amazon to build affordable housing, which put her directly into the crosshairs of Jeff Bezos last year when she won re-election despite Amazon's unprecedented $1.5 million in corporate tax spending aimed at defeating the movement. Shama, tell us from your experience and your perspective as an organizer in chief in Seattle, how do we effectively take our movement forward to continue to fight for Bernie's platform? How do we address the enormous crises before us and win lasting victories for working and young people? Thanks, Alicia, and good afternoon, good evening to all the activists and working people who are tuned in from different time zones. Uh, as Alicia mentioned, we are fighting to tax Amazon and big business here in Seattle to immediately fund cash assistance for up to 100,000 working families who are most impacted by the crisis. And starting next year, raising $500 million by putting a modest tax on the largest corporations of this city to fund a massive expansion of social housing, jobs, and the Green New Deal. And in fact, right now, as we speak, I had to leave the action conference that's going on right now for the Tax Amazon Ballot Initiative and call into this phone call. And I'll, after this, I'll be going back to join the action conference where the attendees, almost 200 of them, are going to be voting on an exciting resolution to really build the signature gathering despite the pandemic and social distancing, which really shows how, uh, you know, despite the challenges, working people want to fight. And what we're seeing with this health crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic is that it's combined with a renewed economic crisis and a looming threat of environmental catastrophe. And it's becoming clearer to uh, uh, millions of people, working people, that the capitalist system isn't providing a future for us, for working people, for young people, for women, for people of color. And this dire situation cries out for leadership more than ever. And the corporate controlled Democratic Party isn't offering solutions. In this situation, it is extremely regrettable, as Alicia mentioned, that Bernie Sanders is endorsing Biden and focusing his efforts of support for this puppet of the billionaire class, rather than on accelerating our, our fight for Medicare for all, for the Green New Deal, for protective equipment for many of our workers, and taxing the rich. 
It is precisely because of the potential in Bernie's campaign and the movement behind him that this is such a historic mistake. You know, because Bernie's campaign showed the massive potential for building independent working class politics in this country. It showed the type of movement that's possible, a record breaking one and a half million people donated to Bernie's campaign, 2.2 million individual donations in February before Super Tuesday, including 350,000 new donors. A historic number of people volunteered around the nation. Bernie was the only candidate that was endorsed by the youth-led Sunrise Movement. His campaign won endorsements from important unions, especially notable from the Nurses Union, uh, which now, you know, in, in this uh, pandemic situation is extremely important because of the frontline role being played by healthcare workers in combating the pandemic and saving lives. The United States has the most billionaires in any country, but lacks basic protective equipment for healthcare workers and other essential workers. While Trump ignored clear warnings, Democrats in the House and Senate worked with Republicans to bail out Wall Street and the big banks, while basic protections for workers are still not being addressed. Bernie's campaign mobilized historic numbers of Latino voters in California and Nevada for propelling him to decisive victories there. Bernie's program really ignited a fire among working people. It called out the billionaire class saying billionaires should not exist, which we completely agree with. A, a Green New Deal, a Medicare for all, ending the racist mass incarceration system. And he defended his version of democratic socialism at a time when both Pelosi and Trump demonize any alternatives to corporate politics or to capitalism. So while Bernie made a fundamental mistake by dropping out and doubling down on that by backing Biden, these things don't change the reality that his campaign showed the deep willingness among millions of working class people to fight for fundamental change for a political revolution against the billionaire class. Bernie himself emphasized, not me, us. Now it's time for us to build off the foundations established by Bernie's campaign to build a new working class political party with a working class program that's free from corporate cash and influence, which is accountable to ordinary people, not the billionaires and the oligarchs in power today. Our movement needs to learn the lessons of Bernie's campaign so as not to repeat them in the future. I think the biggest mistake Bernie made was running within the confines of the corporate dominated and rigged Democratic Party primary process. In addition to this, Bernie should not have continually emphasized his points of agreement with corporate anti-worker Democrats like Joe Biden, especially in the lead up to Super Tuesday. I don't think Bernie's campaign should hand over the donor list uh, to big business and corporate interests. Instead, he should use those lists to organize a mass conference of his supporters to discuss next steps, including how his powerful fundraising base should be used to continue the movement and to build a new party for working people. Bernie also held back criticisms of Elizabeth Warren, even as her campaign stoked unfounded allegations of sexism against him as, he, as she capitulated to the health insurance industry and big pharma by presenting a pivot towards a watered down version of Medicare for all, which ended up you know, just uh, angering and demoralizing working people. And as she stayed in the race with no chance of winning as the political establishment consolidated around Joe Biden in the days leading up to Super Tuesday. And as she doubled down on her decision in 2016 to not endorse Bernie. Bernie did not want his supporters how vicious and dirty the Democratic National Committee establishment would fight back. As Marxists, we understand that there are setbacks in struggles and sometimes working class people will lose fights. What's crucial is that we walk away from the experience with an understanding of the class relations between working people and billionaire oligarchs. And that's the key to understanding the outcome of any social movement. We have to push back against the corporate media's attempts to blame working people for fighting for their needs. We should do that unapologetically and instead explain that next time we need to build a stronger movement with more clarity about the obstacles our movements face. Right now, working people are facing an unprecedented crisis. Even before COVID, almost uh, 
a third of renters were paying nearly half of their income on rent. Healthcare was already unaffordable for millions of people, and those who have healthcare don't have decent healthcare. Student and consumer debt was already crippling, with 70% of Americans having less than $1,000 in savings and 45% having no savings at all. Over 100,000 people, overwhelmingly working class people, have died from COVID-19. Over 30 million people are unemployed. While Republicans and Democrats are jockeying over when these benefits expire, few are talking about bold proposals like taxing the rich or the Amazon tax like we are fighting for in Seattle to fund social services. Few are standing up against the effort of big business to make working people pay for this crisis. It's especially outrageous that the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, is making additional billions and profiteering from this crisis. And he's now on track to become the world's first trillionaire by 2026. And uh, other billionaire shareholders and multimillionaire shareholders and executives of Amazon and other big corporations are also profiteering from this crisis. And Amazon is making these record profits at the same time that it's denying its workers their basic rights. They just announced that they're going to end the $2 hazard pay and the double overtime for warehouse workers. Uh, and how did Amazon respond by uh, respond to workers who were fighting in the warehouses to make their workplaces safer? By firing the main organizers. This is a pattern of anti-worker behavior by Amazon. And as Alicia mentioned last year, during our re-election campaign here in Seattle, Amazon and the billionaire class spent an unprecedented $1.5 million to seek revenge against my socialist council office and our movement for daring to tax Amazon, for daring to fight for a city that works for us working people. Amazon lost last year and working people won last year. And after winning re-election, Socialist Alternative organized a white campaign to tax Amazon this year, uh, which we are in the midst of uh, while uh, collaborating uh, with local unions, the Democratic Socialists of America and Bernie supporters. As the crisis of COVID fully developed, we recognized that it is even more necessary to act quickly because the needs are now more magnified in the midst of the pandemic. Across the country, state and city governments controlled by both the Republican and the Democratic parties are discussing austerity measures. Shameful, it's shameful to be discussing austerity measures to make working people pay for this crisis. For instance, Andrew Cuomo, governor of New York, wants to bust teachers unions and further privatize public education. We need tax the rich movements, not only in Seattle, but we need to win here and spread across the nation just like how we won $15 minimum wage here in Seattle and it spread across the nation. Uh, in Seattle, of course, Amazon and other big businesses absolutely oppose. They fiercely oppose our efforts. And one of the best tools they have in their toolkit is the local Democratic Party establishment. These are the same people who worked overtime to stop Bernie and now they effectively work for Amazon. There was a saying during the anti-apartheid movement if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. Last week, the Seattle City Council, as I, said, as I mentioned before, has, has, uh, you know, has been uh, working behind the scenes with Amazon and other big business spokespeople. But what they did last week was a democratic establishment of the city arbitrarily decided to delay even discussing the Amazon tax legislation that I've put forward in the city committee meet, city council com committee meetings by making a legalistic excuses and not very competent legalistic excuses at that. And this attack, which is clearly an attack, it shows how democratic establishment officials dance to the tune of big business, not, you know, not uh, acting for the needs of working people. Imagine if renters just, uh, decided not to pay rent or uninsured people delayed healthcare bills. Uh, this is why my organization, Socialist Alternative, is calling for a ballot initiative uh, for taxing Amazon, in addition to having a legislation that's been put forward by my office, because 
It is only through the pressure of a grassroots movement building towards a ballot initiative that voters can directly vote on that we will be able to put the pressure on this establishment dominated city council. And as I said, we are voting today on carrying out a really full fledged effort to collect signatures to get on the ballot. And we are launching the next Saturday, we are going to be launching what we're calling the Amazon Tax Prime delivery service to bring printed ballot petitions to people during the pandemic. And it's challenging during this social distancing. We will maintain social distancing. We will do it in the safest way possible, but not going all out to fight is not an option. And in fact, this is not just a story of Seattle. Nationwide, working people have no choice but to get organized. If you are watching this and you are in Seattle, you should absolutely get involved in our efforts to tax Amazon, and you should uh, get online in a couple of hours to our action conference as well, and join us in the Amazon Tax Prime letter delivery and signature collection effort. In many states across the country, bans on eviction are all already being lifted. Tens of millions of renters are going to be facing a very real, real prospect of being evicted. Tens of millions uh, could be thrown out. And uh, now over 3 million people have signed a petition to organize a rent strike, meaning a real opposition to evictions, a real opposition to having to pay rent to the big landlords, the corporate uh, landlords, the property management corporations, and to the big banks, while we have, many of us have lost our jobs. And my organization, Socialist Alternative, has been playing a leading role, not only in Seattle, but in, in our in many cities across the nation, organizing the local chapters of the rent strike movement. And the rent strike movement is demanding that we suspend or cancel without consequences, rent, mortgage, and utility payments uh, in order to make sure that working people are maintaining their, uh, you know, have their right to housing and don't get evicted. And I don't think this is in any way an abstract notion. What has happened since the last recession, the great 2007, 2008 great recession, you know, since the, in the 10 years since then, we've seen nearly 8 million foreclosures of working class and middle class homeowners. That was a stunning way in which the billionaire class extracted the price of that recession from working people. That's exactly what will happen to a massive wave of evictions and foreclosures in the coming years if we don't fight back. Socialist Alternative also organized an initiative called Workers Speak Out, where frontline workers can connect with others, discuss their conditions, and plan out actions. I, I hope the organizers of this event are sharing the Facebook uh, page link where if you're a, a worker, if you and your coworkers would like to join this group and discuss how you can get organized and learn from others who are organizing, share your own lessons so that other workers can learn from them please join our Workers Speak Out group. We have many workers from different industries, including healthcare workers who are part of that. Now, all indications are that Trump is trying to reopen the economy with, without basic protections like mandatory protective equipment, even with new laws that protect corporations from lawsuits filed by workers. And if they were to have their say, workers will have no right to decide how we should go back to work and what safety conditions we can demand. Workers are organizing across the country for protective equipment and for hazard pay. Workers are saying throughout the nation, we won't die for Wall Street, but we need to get organized even further. We need mass movements in the workplaces on the streets. We need to fight the reopening of the economy until we have mass testing and contact tra tracing capacity to prevent a second and more deadly wave of the virus, which we have seen happen in other countries. It must be coupled with a massive expansion of unemployment benefits guaranteed to all workers immediately, including undocumented immigrants, gig economy workers, and part-time workers. We need workers to have a veto over return to work. When we go back to work, under what conditions we will go back to work. And we need COVID safety committees in all workplaces to independently monitor health and safety to stop the boss's attempts to put their profits over our lives. We saw, you know, a seventh where Amazon warehouse worker has just lost their life because of COVID. And in fact, the workers don't even hear about this, the rates of health crisis and deaths among their coworkers. 
uh, from Amazon, the corporation. They learn about it informally when they when workers are talking about it. That's how shamefully uh, the corporations and the bosses are completely uncaring of the lives of working people. At the same time, tenants are organizing, as, at the same time as workers are organizing, tenants are organizing as part of uh, the rent strike movement to cancel all rents, as I mentioned. Pelosi and Schumer, both corporate Democrats, have indicated they're willing to negotiate for meager extensions to unemployment. That will not be enough. It will be up to working people to ensure a safe reopening and demand our full rights. We will need to support workers who organize on their jobs because they will very likely face retaliation. There needs to be community solidarity for workers who get organized, who walk off their jobs, or who even go on strike. Sanders supporters should take these efforts up energetically and out of it, we can build a strong working class movement to fight for Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, and other items of Bernie's platform, and much more than that. It's clear that the Democratic Party leadership will do everything they can to sabotage these efforts. We want to stop Trump's agenda. At the same time, we will need a serious strategy to fight the right, not just Trump. We need a consistent movement from below against racism, sexism, and all forms of inequality. We need, we see the cynical way the Democratic establishment has dropped the hashtag Me Too when it became, the moment it became inconvenient for them. We should also remember what paved the way for Trump in the first place. The Democratic establishment failed to deliver for working people. Our movement cannot support Biden in this election. We must build our own struggles with our own clear program. And we must be very clear that we will need to build a new party for working people. Biden mocked policies like Medicare for all, even as COVID now poses a dire threat to our lives, especially those of us who lack access to healthcare. Biden has decades long record as a reliable servant of Wall Street. Now Biden and the Democratic Party establishment are glossing over credible allegations of sexual assault, implicitly validating Trump as the predator in chief in the process. If two scandal ridden billionaire backed aging white men are the best candidates US capitalism can produce, working people need an alternative. Instead of putting money and resources into supporting a pro corporate candidate, our union should be building a mass campaign for workplace safety, organizing the unorganized production of protective equipment and extending unemployment benefits. Instead of giving Biden left cover, Bernie supporters should instead support movements around tenants organizing like rent strike struggles to tax the rich like tax Amazon in Seattle. Bernie's donor list should be used to mobilize for movements like these not handed over to Biden. Going forward, we need, an, we need independent socialist candidates to provide an alternative to the corporate parties and politicians. These movements from our unions, tenants, poor people, young people, workers can help lay the basis for what's really needed, a new working class party in this country, independent of corporate money and corporate power that fights unambiguously for working people and stops at nothing to break the power of the billionaire class. Solidarity. Thanks for kicking us off, Shama. I know, unfortunately, you're unable to stay because you have to return to the Tax Amazon conference happening um, in Seattle, but the struggle is 24 seven and we all understand um, I think it's important to have opened um, this discussion with an overview of the vast range of the movement's participants, pointing to its massive potential to unite and coordinate struggles in the US. Um, this is a movement that can't afford to demobilize every few years, especially now as these crises reach a continuous fever pitch. This points to the need for the very kind of bold leadership that you're providing in Seattle, um, coming from every corner of our movement. Uh, leadership willing to decisively stand up to corporate politicians and CEOs. We can't afford continued compromise with the, we can't afford continued compromises with those who have no 
problem, saddling workers and young people with the costs of these crises. And no individual leaders can do this alone, whether we're talking about you know, leaders in our workplaces and in our unions um, or at our schools, they require the very sort of organized grassroots pressure that you're talking about. Um, and we know the Democratic Party ultimately bows to the pressure of their corporate backers. We need to continue to organize a greater and opposite pressure on the basis of our collective power as workers. We are the backbone of our society and so society should be organized by us and for us. Um, if you've only just tuned in now, I want to remind everyone to please sign in using the link on your screen. Our organizers will also post that again in the comments section. Um, and remember, you can submit questions for our panel to respond to during the discussion portion of this town hall. Um, next, I want to turn over to Tyler, who's a Labor for Bernie organizer. Tyler's name will forever be etched in the history of Minneapolis as one on a lawsuit filed by low-wage workers against Minneapolis City Council for undemocratically blocking a ballot initiative for $15 an hour. He kept organizing with Socialist Alternative and eventually Minneapolis became the first Midwest city to pass 15. He now works at the post office and is actively organizing against Trump's attempts to privatize the postal service. So Tyler, tell us about your experience defending the Postal Service and how can we continue the fight for Bernie's pro-worker agenda? What's the way forward for the labor movement amidst the pandemic and economic crisis? Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Uh, so my name is Tyler Vassar. Like Alicia said, I'm a letter carrier at the United States Postal Service. I'm a part of the National Association of Letter Carriers Union, Branch 9 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, I'm a member as well, I'm a member of Socialist Alternative. Um, so I helped organize and lead Minnesota Labor for Bernie starting in December of 2019 until Super Tuesday. And that was, we were able to bring together union, union activists from dozens of union locals from across the Twin Cities, that's Minneapolis and our neighboring city, St. Paul. And we held a series of, of really well attended meetings as well as a few door knocks and a uh, rally before Super Tuesday. And something that was really striking to me is that most people were pretty new to being uh, active, like in their union or in their workplace. And I think it was a lot, it was inspired by Bernie's campaign. They were inspired by Bernie's campaign to do more, to organize, not only for Bernie, but also like in their union, in their workplace going forward. And I think that shows like how a powerful working class campaign can really inspire people to get active, maybe for the first time even. Um, at the Postal Service, we'll be entering, just quite frankly, we'll be entering a monumental struggle. Uh, we have to fight against attempts to privatize the Postal Service and attack the gains that postal unions have won over the past years. Um, and so I wanna give a brief background. Uh, I wanna keep it brief just for time, but if there's a lot of detail, so people can obviously should look into it a little more. There's been a lot of media coverage lately, but I wanna give a brief overview so we're on the same page. Uh, corporate forces have long had their eye on privatizing the Postal Service for decades now, since the, since the 80s at, the, at, at least. Um, but more recently in 2006, Congress passed the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. The biggest thing that was in that that affects us today is was the pre-funding mandate that uh, forced the Postal Service to, re to fund retiree benefits 70 years into the future. It's the only federal agency forced to do this, and it was clearly an excuse to force financial problems on the Postal Service so they can more easily make the case for privatization. Uh, it's a classic thing. We've seen it over and over again. In 2018, Trump's task force on the US postal system issued a report. It recommended privatization, cutting service, raising rates, and under the guise of revising collective bargaining, attacking and att attempting to break the postal unions. Now with the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic uh, crisis and downturn, uh, it's caused a dramatic decrease in mail volume, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent, and which has only further exasperated the financial problems at the Postal Service. Um, now, on top of that, it was just uh, announced, I think a few weeks ago, the incoming Postmaster General, uh, which is Louis DeJoy, the post, he's starting in mid-July. The Postmaster General is kind of like the CEO of the Postal Service. Um, some background on Louis DeJoy, he's donated millions of dollars to Trump and the Republican Party. He's the Republican Party fundraiser for, um, I think it's North Carolina, and he's a former CEO of XPO Logistics, which are inf they're infamous for union busting, um, pushing automation, and an all-around really horrible record of labor violations. So, like, clearly, he was appointed 
for a reason in this moment to carry out the Trump administration's plans to privatize the Postal Service and attack the Postal Unions. Um, there has been some organizing happening around this, around COVID-19, as well as the financial crisis. Over 70 postal workers have died from uh, COVID-19. Um, and then, you know, I'm a part of a group of rank and file postal organizers uh, that have organized some small actions and standouts, uh, most notably in Seattle, Portland, and Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, it's difficult uh, during quarantine, especially on the West Coast, it was a little more strict. Um, but it was still, it's still good to get media attention for those things because the Postal Service is incredibly popular and most people don't know about the, the man-made financial crisis. Um, and I, I myself am meeting with local union leadership with a few other carriers from my station next week to plan an informational picket outside of the central post office in downtown Minneapolis. Um, I think ultimately this crisis shows the absolute need for us to rebuild a strong labor movement with fighting unions and leadership that's willing to confront and lead a fight back against a horrible boss or corporation, or in my case, against an incoming postmaster general who is clearly not our friend, who has a long history of union busting and was appointed for a reason to carry out privatization. And I think we should be like completely clear that it'd be much better for our movement if Bernie was still in the race. I mean, even if he didn't have a chance of winning, now more than ever, we need political representatives who are fighters for working people. Bernie had what, like a million active volunteers and many more supporters. He could use his position to mobilize supporters to informational picket lines, uh, put pressure on Congress and overall be a megaphone for our movement. And I think that's exactly what was so powerful about when he called himself, he was saying he would be an organizer in chief in the White House, is exactly those things. Um, in 2016, most major national unions came out very early endorsing Clinton. Um, a notable exceptions being the nurses, the American Postal Workers Union, which represents the inside workers at the plants, and uh, uh, Amalgamated Transit Union. Um, there was a lot of pushback and anger from members over that just sort of undemocratic decision to just really early on, like, oh yeah, Hillary Clinton, we're endorsing. Uh, and I, so I think a lot of national union leaderships learned a lesson from that. I think they weren't learned the wrong lesson <laughs> because uh, in 2020, most union leaderships completely abstained from endorsing. And the idea was that a lot of them came out saying, my union came out, oh, we'll wait until the primary is over um, because they didn't want to cause a stir. But I think like union support and resources could have played a crucial role in pushing Bernie through, pushing him through the media and establishment onslaught that sought to prop up Joe Biden at all costs. And so, you know, what kind of political representatives do unions and workers need? I think we need political representatives that are directly accountable to working people and our movement, similar to what Shama pointed out earlier. You know, elected on a program that addresses the lack of affordable housing, the low wages, the extremely high cost of health care during a pandemic of all things, and in many ways would be running on a, a very similar platform to what Bernie ran on and which inspired millions of people to get involved maybe for the first time in politics. And so ultimately, I think this, this points to the need for a new party for working people, you know, independent of the Democrats, connected directly to labor and social movements and actually accountable to us. Um, and I think through the course of the struggle at the Postal Service and um, other labor struggles that are inevitably going to break out, this, this idea that we need our own party will be made crystal clear. And um, I just want to end on just highlighting workers speak out. Uh, you know, I've, it's been a really great initiative, uh, initiated by Socialist Alternative. It's really, really great for helping, especially essential workers connect. Um, and I've been able to connect with a few postal workers and connect them to our rank and file postal organizers group that meets weekly to try to plan stuff, coordinate stuff nationally. So I know I personally, it's been really helpful for me. Um, and, yeah, I think this sort of thing is necessary in this moment as workers are organizing around COVID-19 related concerns and we're really only beginning to rebuild a fighting labor movement. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Tyler. Yeah, I think the struggle of the US postal workers right now highlights um, the enormous battles to come that will particularly hit public sector workers. I definitely dread this as a high school teacher, um, well aware of the decades long process already at work to dismantle public education. Um, already state and city officials are warning of massive budget cuts and we see the vultures of privatization already circling things like public education and other vital services 
services and utilities, just as we saw in the South after Hurricanes Katrina and Maria, and during the housing and foreclosure crisis of the 2008 recession. We know the script of disaster capitalism. That's why it's so urgent that we immediately train our efforts, not towards supporting Biden's basement bid for president, but toward the inevitable fights ahead to defend our jobs, social services, and homes. And this fight will uh, exist regardless of who is president, right? So long as it's the two corporate parties that run our political system. Many of the reforms that we've been fighting for during the campaign to elect Bernie Sanders offer real solutions that won't be conceded without a powerful movement from below. Um, and these will be impossible to implement under capitalism so long as a few people possess the vast majority of wealth in our society. Bernie's campaign has already laid the basis for such a fight back. Additionally, across the country, um, workers like yourself, Tyler, also frontline workers, including low wage earners, have been organizing for you know, PPE, personal protective equipment, safety measures, hazard pay, and workplace uh, against uh, or organizing for workplace co uh, closures amidst the pandemic spread. Um, we've seen walkouts at Amazon, grocery stores and hospitals, while leading working activists from nurses and factory workers um, have faced retaliation for speaking out against these unsafe working conditions. And these are the leaders that we need to back, that our movement needs to back, right? While some workers have successfully organized and won concessions from their companies, many of these victories are also temporary. Shama talked earlier about Amazon. While Jeff Bezos is on track to become the first trillionaire on the planet, the company is ending the meager $2 an hour in hazard pay for warehouse workers and delivery workers in June. Um, this is no different at some other companies like Kroger's, um, which is also ending its hero pay um, of an extra $2 an hour after CEO McMullen banked a 21% pay raise for himself after 2019. So big business will continue to guilt and threaten workers into accepting unacceptable uh, compensation and conditions unless we join together in solidarity to stop them. Um, so as Tyler and Shama already pointed to, I want to encourage everyone watching this town hall to join the Workers Speak Out coronavirus lockdown group on Facebook. Workers Speak Out has given a voice to thousands of workers on the front lines of the coronavirus crisis um, through blog posts, video interviews, um, the regular sharing of articles and posts documenting these experiences. We've also held several successful national and industry specific town halls to discuss particular workplace struggles and strategies to help rebuild a fighting labor movement, um, including our unions and organizing unorganized workers. In this era of social distancing and corporate controlled media, we need to use all of the tools available to us to share our organizing experiences and discuss the demands and strategies for our movement um, to take up. All are welcome to join this group um, and are encouraged to invite their coworkers, friends, and family to join these conversations. And as Tyler pointed out, the social media group is really a starting point. We should be using it as a tool to jumpstart real on the ground organizing in our workplaces, communities, and schools. Um, with that note, Bernie's campaign has found an echo not just with the most progressive and militant labor activists, but also with young people and students. Next, we'll hear from Rebecca Robins, uh, chapter coordinator of the Pittsburgh Students for Bernie group. Rebecca is a student at Carnegie Mellon University. In addition to playing a leading role in organizing students for Bernie, she also helped build her school's student labor coalition, which recently helped campus service workers secure a better union contract and continues to build solidarity between students and local labor struggles. She's also played a key role in organizing students in the fight for a Green New Deal and to defend socialist state representative Summer Lee, who faces attacks this year from her own party as she uh, heads into the delayed June primary. Rebecca, tell us about the role of youth in continuing to fight for a political revolution. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I think Bernie's campaign was so historic because his class struggle movement-based approach 
really spoke to young people and he was able to win over the support of millions of young people, many of whom organized under this banner of Students for Bernie, a volunteer apparatus that was entirely run by students and young people. And it even included high school students who weren't old enough to vote, but still felt inspired to join the political revolution. In Pittsburgh, Students for Bernie was incredibly tied to youth-led and working class movements on our campuses and in the city. And our members are still organizing to support workers' struggles and standing with workers on our campuses, like Alicia mentioned, fighting for climate action and a Green New Deal, and volunteering to elect down-ballot socialists like State Representative Summer Lee, who's under attack from the Democratic establishment and the oil and gas industry because they want to stop her grassroots movement. But we know that Bernie's campaign was also under attack from the Democratic Party, as well as the corporate media and the billionaire class, because he had this grassroots momentum that won endorsements from organizations like the Sunrise Movement, as well as dozens of unions. And while the ruling class is trying to divide the climate movement on generational lines and pit workers against one another, Bernie showed that it's possible to build an intergenerational movement on a national scale. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party establishment is tied by a million threads to fossil fuel capitalism. Nancy Pelosi called the Green New Deal the Green Dream or whatever, and the mayor of Pittsburgh, who once stood up to Trump after he quit the Paris Agreement, dismissed what he called the New Green Deal after hundreds of workers and young people filled the streets of Pittsburgh last September to demand climate action in a city that on some days is measured to have the worst air quality in the country due to pollution, and a city where kids, especially in black and brown neighborhoods and working class neighborhoods are growing up with higher rates of asthma. We can't afford to wait and the climate can't afford to wait. We can't afford four more years of Trump, but we also can't afford four more years of corporate fossil fuel friendly Democrats. But we also know that social movements are so strong that they can even force reactionary regimes to grant us concessions. Like many of the progressive reforms were won under the Nixon years, like the end to the Vietnam War, abortion rights in Roe v. Wade, and the creation of the EPA, because of powerful movements built and grown on the left, and millions of working people taking to the streets despite a horrible right-wing administration. History shows time and time again that the key to winning is organizing. And as students, we can still organize in the age of COVID-19. Youth members of Socialist Alternative Sister Organization in Ireland played a key role building a campaign to cancel the end of year standardized exam for secondary school students and they won. Members of Students for Bernie at Colorado State University Fort Collins put pressure on their university administration for PPE and masks for RAs working desk shifts and opt options for safe remote work and won. We should learn from these movements and these victories as university boards and corporate politicians continue to put profit over the health of students and workers, as Republican governors are pushing to open schools. And also news that I just got today, the president of my university was reportedly on a call with other university presidents and Vice President Mike Pence, um, where colleges mentioned seeking protection from lawsuits if they reopen campuses for the fall semester and students get sick. Young people are already facing a bleak future under capitalism, and we've been facing this since before the pandemic hit. Racism, sexism, climate change, growing up now through two recessions, constant imperialist wars, never ending student debt. So it's no coincidence that young people are increasingly embracing socialism because the need for a fundamental socialist transformation of society has never been clearer. The climate catastrophe has already demonstrated the need for a planned economy to retool industry and society on a truly sustainable basis by creating millions of good paying union jobs to do things like harnessing renewable energy and expanding sustainable public transportation. And now as we face a pandemic with a healthcare system completely decimated by privatization and cuts to services, leaving hospitals understaffed a shortage of essential applies like masks and respirators, and millions of people unable to afford healthcare, the state of healthcare today also highlights the need not only for Medicare for all, but for a democratically controlled fully public healthcare system. As young people, our energy and militancy can inspire other generations to join us in this struggle for a better world. 
like when the union UE joined us at the Pittsburgh climate strike in September with their secretary treasurer mentioning in his speech that unions and organized labor should stand with all young people fighting for a better world or the solidarity that we saw in the picket lines between students and teachers and education workers during the wave of teacher strikes. It's this alliance between labor and youth that terrifies the ruling class who wants to keep us divided. So what does this mean for the movement around Bernie? We can't let this energy and what we built through this campaign dissipate. And to be frank, young people are not going to put our support and energy into the campaign of a moderate politician who refuses to support Medicare for all during a pandemic, said he has no empathy for the struggles of the younger generation, is a recorded abuser, and promised wealthy donors that nothing would fundamentally change if he were elected. Working within the Democratic Party meant that Bernie couldn't debate Trump because he spent all of his time debating corporate politicians within his own party. And working within the Democratic Party means that even progressive incumbents aren't safe in primaries as their party endorses older, whiter, wealthier establishment candidates. So what does this point to? We need something bigger than an electoral machine. We need a new party that genuinely represents the interests of working and young people. A party tied to movements like the climate movement and the labor movement, like Tyler was saying. A party that's about more than just getting out the vote for the lesser of two evils every two to four years. Instead, a party that poses an actual political alternative and organizes working people to fight for things like Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, and canceling rent and mortgages during the crisis. Socialist Alternative is a fighting organization of workers and young people aiming to help build such a party of the 99%. And you can join us in the struggle at the link that's going to be posted in the comments as well as the link that's on your screen. We have a world to win. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, and you touched on so many important things, um, not only on the massive debt that millions of students face right now, but the evictions and the mass unemployment um, that will also be an issue in the years to come. Young people are among the millions of renters currently unable to afford their rent, and they certainly won't be able to pay it back later as landlords come to collect when the eviction moratoriums actually lift. After the 2008 crisis, we saw millions of homeowners and renters lose their homes while the Democratic Party bailed out Wall Street and those responsible for the crisis at that time. And we should expect no different from both corporate parties today. This is why we need to start organizing in our buildings and neighborhoods right now, including those who perhaps can afford to pay their rent or mortgage, but are willing to stand in solidarity with their neighbors. Across the US, renters are already taking matters into their own hands and are organizing tenant and community, member, uh, community meetings online and over the phone. Newly formed tenants councils are already negotiating reduced rents and other protections, and some are discussing the possibilities for rent strikes to win concessions. Historically, tenant organizing has led to huge victories in defeating rent hikes and evictions, including during the Great Depression. The rent strike is an extremely powerful tool in this, but it is only successful as a collective action. As individuals were vulnerable and feeling the special isolation of the quarantine on top of all of this, but together in numbers, we can stand up to our landlords and big developers who themselves are organizing to squeeze as much from us as they can during this crisis. Not unsurprisingly like the university presidents um, that Rebecca pointed to earlier. They can't evict us all, nor can our bosses fire us all if we all stick together and coordinate our demands and tactics to build a powerful organized movement. And so I encourage everyone watching right now to join the millions demanding rent, mortgage, and utility payment cancellations, which Rebecca called for a moment ago, and start um, organizing in your city. Um, find your local Rent Strike 2020 Facebook group page. Um, a link should appear that will point you to a list of groups where you can connect with other renters, some who may have the same landlord as you, um, and you'll be able to find tips for organizing your own neighbors and getting started. It's as simple as knocking on someone's door, of course, with personal protective equipment, um, leaving a letter with your contact information. These are the necessary first steps to building a movement capable of defending our homes in the fight 
decades to come. But beyond this, we have to link our struggles across our buildings and with the labor movement to fight for universal rent control and expanded social housing. As with labor organizing, this is another crucial avenue that Bernie supporters can grow our movement. And remember, if you have questions about getting involved, whether in rent strike or workers speak out, um, you can ask those questions in the comment section of our Facebook and YouTube feeds, um, and we can try and get to them during the um, question and answer discussion um, that we're about to start. Um, I also want to remind those only recently joining us for this town hall to please sign in at the link to be posted on the screen and in the comments. Again, this will allow us to get in touch with you later um, and help put you in touch with other tenants, other, other workers to help organize our movement going forward. Um, so now we're going to have, um, we're going to spend some time like discussing amongst the panelists um, answers to some of the questions that are coming up over the course of the discussion. Um, I want to start with a question um, for Tyler. Um, this question comes from Anna Kelto. How can we get the votes of working people who align themselves with the Republican Party and voted for Trump? And I think um, in particular, this is like really underscoring that like there are working people who um, voted for Trump. Maybe you can also talk about why that is. Um, go ahead. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um... I think, you know, a campaign and like a program based on class issues is how we can overcome these sort of cultural issues. These cultural issues are used like very cynically by the two corporate parties to, you know, to divide people um, when even, even, you know, working class people from each other. Um, and I think Bernie's campaign ultimately proved that, that that's possible, that a working class program and a mass movement approach can appeal and can break people away from, uh, you know, supporting Trump. Even, almost even, not more important, but also equally important, I think, is that Bernie's campaign, proved, you know, was able to appeal to people who aren't normally political, who aren't normally uh, politi politically engaged. Because um, for the first time, they're seeing a program that actually speaks to their interests, actually speaks to their needs as, you know, as a working class person or whatever. Um, and I think we should just be clear, like, the Democrats bailed out the banks in 2008. They let, basically let foreclosures you know, wreak havoc across the country. And what do they do? They bailed out the banks. And that totally opened up space on the right to use that, you know, cynically for their gains. Trump was able to somehow, someone who was born and raised in the establishment, comes directly from, you know, a super wealthy family, was able to pose as an anti-establishment candidate because of, because of the betrayal from the Democratic Party, um, specifically around the Great, Great Recession and their response to it. And so I think just to reiterate, like a working class program can, can really cut across that and really show, you know, the hollowness of that statement that Trump is somehow anti-establishment or yeah, anti-establishment. Um, yeah, that's kind of, hope that answers your question. Thanks, yeah, I think those are really important points. Um, and in some respects, I think are related to a couple of questions that we're getting that I actually am gonna take a stab at here. Um, so there is a question from Nam De Plume questions. Um, how do we deal with the effects of Bernie's strategic blunders, both in 2016 and 2020? I mean, I think this is actually related to another question from Chris. Can Bernie delegates influence the party platform in an attempt to reform the Democratic Party? Um, and I'll take this question as someone who is on the ballot as a PA delegate for Bernie Sanders. Um, so um, not everyone might know this, but this past week, the DNC voted to potentially allow for a virtual convention in August. Originally, it was planned for July in Milwaukee. Um, Biden has agreed to allow Sanders to keep delegates and Sanders has urged delegates to turn towards influencing the party platform. Um, but the question that I have as a Bernie delegate um, with no illusions in the Democratic Party um, is on what basis is the party being, or is this party unity being forged? Um, and at what cost? Like what are we giving up by deferring to the same corporate party that spent millions against us 
while demonizing our working class movement and while demonizing people like Tara Reid um, for standing up to Joe Biden, um, who is now accused of sexual assault against her. Um, I think also we should understand that without any serious measures of accountability in the Democratic Party, the party platform is non-binding. Um, we also know that everything that we've been fighting for during this campaign, things like Medicare for all, won't be won without the movement that the party has worked so hard to neutralize and demoralize. So imagine if we refocused our efforts right now away from the party that um, time and time again has co-opted our movements, um, is now trying to co-opt our material resources um, to elect Joe Biden, has co-opted the movement against gun violence, the Me Too movement, a range of social justice movements. Imagine if we turn that towards a new party that was completely, um, that had complete, completely broken um, with this um, continued failed strategy um, that's yoked to the corporate elite. Um, so I think that Bernie's strategic errors in 2016 and 2020 were to divert the movement away from the immense potential that exists before us um, to really fight um, on an independent basis um, and on the basis of our collective organizing power um, to point away from the, to point away from this, from an independent mass organization towards a party that is no political home for ordinary people, not for workers, not for young people. Um, and I think too, we have to remember that there have been movements in the past, the civil rights movement, the women's liberation movement, these movements like under Ronald Reagan, um, were able to win um, immense victories, abortion rights, um, some of the earliest environmental protections. Um, we absolutely have the ability to win and f uh, win like victories like a Green New Deal um, and like Medicare for all under Trump. But we keep going down this road of like lesser evilism and pointing back towards the ballot box when really we have immense power when we organize as a movement from below. Um, and I think going forward, we can, um, you know, correct this like continued strategic error by building the kinds of organizations that we've been talking about and uniting them under a common independent party with a common um, platform for working people. Um, so next, I want to turn over to Rebecca. There is this question from Rebel K. What does it mean for capitalism when unemployment is at 30 million um, and Jeff Bezos is about to be a trillionaire? So what can be done? Um, and you can answer this from the perspective as a young person right now, but I'm sure you have a much wider perspective to offer as a young socialist right now as well. Yeah, I think especially what we're seeing right now during the coronavirus pandemic is that it's not people like Jeff Bezos and the CEOs who are actually producing all the wealth. It's not the bankers, it's not the corporate landlords, it's ordinary workers who are now deemed essential but aren't being paid um, an essential wage or a living wage. So what we're seeing now is an industry that is essential with the CEO um, who's on track to be a trillionaire. Meanwhile, um, workers in Amazon warehouses um, are fighting for things like PPE and closing down warehouses for cleaning um, when someone um, is diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, we had um, an Amazon warehouse worker from the JFK warehouse in Staten Island who helped lead those walkouts, Jordan Flowers, speak on a socialist alternative town hall as well as on a Pittsburgh Students for Bernie meeting, talking about all of these things that these workers are going through. And these workers in the warehouses are the ones who are producing all of the wealth. Meanwhile, Jeff Bezos is the one profiting off of the labor of all of these workers and making all the money. And meanwhile, for workers who aren't in essential industries who've been laid off, capitalism fails to provide people the basic resources that they need to survive, housing, healthcare. Um, social services have been completely decimated um, by cuts from corporate politicians of both parties um, throughout the years, leaving people unable to uh, have the basic resources that they need to survive in a time when it's not a pandemic, um, let alone during a pandemic with unemployment mirroring the astronomical rates of the Great Depression. 
Um, and I think as we see um, industries um, deemed essential by the government, like these meat packing plants where workers are forced to work in unsafe conditions, um, or auto workers not wanting to go back into the auto plants despite what their union leadership says, we see like a necessity there for, or an opportunity really um, and seeing like that there is space um, for workers to actually take control of their industries and what that would actually look like and how that could change um, what this pandemic would look like. Um, if, if we had a society that wasn't organized to put profit over people and planet, workers could demand that their um, workplaces and warehouses close um, during the pandemic, or that industries like the auto industry can be retooled to support to produce the supplies that we need um, to get through the pandemic, like masks and respirators. And I think some uh, GM plants have been retooled to do that to provide supplies for the pandemic. Um, but when we when we look at capitalism, what we see is a society that's organized for a wealthy elite to profit off of the labor of billions of people. And as socialists, what we're calling for is building a new society where workers can have democratic control over their workplaces. People don't have to worry about going to work in essential workplaces just to have enough money to get by and risking getting themselves and their family sick during a crisis like this one. Um, and ultimately a society that could tend to the needs um, of everyone, especially in a time like this, because what we're seeing now is that in the society that we live in, it's not built in a way that can respond to a pandemic adequately and serve the needs um, of people and their health. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, this next question, um, I think I will give over to Tyler. Um, a lot of people understandably fear another four years of Trump, who's been a complete disaster um, for working people and immigrants, women, LGBTQ people. Um, Bernie's identified his number one priority is defeating Trump and now unfortunately is campaigning for Biden as he did in 2016. We had that question earlier about continuous blenders, but this question from Michelle Truskowski, I think is an important one to answer. Um, she says, we must unite all progressive groups and all progressives. Our strength is in numbers. What do you feel is the best way to do that? Um, and maybe a related question is, is not voting for Biden handing the election to Trump and what puts us in the best position to fight all of the systemic problems that gave us Trump in the first place? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that's, a, a you know, in many ways, the ultimate question. Um, I think quite frankly, to begin, we need to break out of the stranglehold of the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party will, you know, take social movements and take, you know, activists in and then push them out for their own gains. Like, you know, I think, I think personally, campaigning or whatever for Joe Biden is a dead end. That is a dead end for social movements and a dead end for progressives. And so I think we need to focus our energies on, uh, you know, you know, continuing the fight around a lot of the things that Bernie put forward, Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, these sorts of things. And I think, you know, ultimately we need to base our movement, our progressive movement, our socialist movement on the power of, of the labor movement, on the power of social movements. And I think a really good, good way to think about that is like, I think part of rebuilding a fighting, you know, powerful labor movement is building and like um, rebuilding solidarity between unions and between industries. That's something we haven't necessarily seen over the last, you know, over the last period, um, in which was that was an essential part of building a strong labor movement in the 30s and 40s and you know, into the into the 60s and 70s um, was building that solidarity between between movements between unions and um, the second part of I think like you just need to be clear about what got us. Trump in the first place. What got us, you know, what gave Trump the ability to pose as an anti-establishment candidate? And I think it's the exact policies that Joe Biden's put forward, put, putting forward, and you know that neoliberal model of, uh, you know, pro-corporate sort of campaign that doesn't actually speak to our interests. And so I think the base, the basic is just like I think we need to base ourselves on, you know, something something similar to Bernie's program of working class program 
that um, is based in social movement, based in labor movement, just to reiterate. <laughs> and um, so we can really start to rebuild that sort of basic solidarity that is the driving force of every, you know, historically it's been a driving force of every progressive movement. Um, yeah. Thanks for um, that response, Tyler. Um, and yeah, I think like what you had said earlier about the Democratic Party and campaigning for Biden as being an, a dead end for our social movements is really important to highlight. One thing I was thinking about earlier, and there was a comment on Facebook that was you know, inquiring a bit more about like how we can win things like a Green New Deal under Trump, for instance. I think it's important to remember, and we missed out on um, what could have been historic uh, youth uh, demonstrations against climate change on Earth Day back in April. Um, but uh, decades ago, you know, on Earth Day, there were huge demonstrations. Um, I think 10% of the population participated in this. And because of that, we have things like the Environmental Protection Agency, right, which were formed under Nixon. Um, and so certainly, again, to like emphasize like the real power is behind our um, ability and capability to um, organize collectively for these things. But importantly, we need an independent party um, to be able to continue these struggles, right? Um, and, you know, continue to organize beyond like each victory. Um, what we saw with like all of these incredible social movements of the 60s and 70s was then dissolved, you know, with some of, again, some elements of it being co-opted by the Democratic Party um, and other elements, you know, straight up being murdered like Martin Luther King Jr. Um, this is what's at stake. Like we're looking at um, decades of historic economic crises and we need to build um, real organizations of struggle and a real party that will work for us indefinitely, right? We can't afford to demobilize every couple of years nor certainly every few decades, especially when there's um, a, an expiration date slapped onto our planet right now at the way that we're you know, producing carbon emissions. Um, I would like to urge our viewers again to um, sign in if you haven't yet. Um, again, we're going to post the link on the screen um, and again in our comment feeds. That's all the time that we have for our question and answer portion. I think that this has been a really great discussion. Um, the compounding crises before us will bring about major struggles for healthcare, housing, living wages, public services, and safety. And we know the Democratic Party leadership will continue to stand in the way of these movements rather than support them. That's why we need um, an independent working class, uh, independent working class candidates, as Shama had pointed to earlier, to help lay the basis for such a party. Bernie's campaign has already played an instrumental role in exposing the brutal failures of the capitalist system by beginning to offer such an alternative and by popularizing socialist ideas, while the two parties of big business offer absolutely no clear way forward for us. Ultimately, a new party by, for, and of working people with real democratic structures can provide the massive organization it'll take to win Bernie's program and more. Independent from corporate interests, such a party can unite youth and social struggles with the labor movement. And it would also be more than an electoral machine, as I think Rebecca um, already started to articulate, like serving to organize the day-to-day -day struggles in our workplaces, schools, and communities, and really empowering us to democratically restructure our economy according to the needs of millions. This is something that our organization, Socialist Alternative, has always fought for and something that we think other progressive organizations and socialist organizations like the DSA um, can play a key role in building. But as billionaires are getting bailed out while working class people are being left further and further behind, um, we need to really keep building fighting organizations like this. Socialist Alternative is a grassroots organization that has continued to organize through the pandemic crisis, relying solely on our members and supporters to fund our work across the country. Despite these conditions, our members have continued to organize safely and virtually. In Seattle, we continue to lead the tax Amazon fight for safe jobs and social housing, hoping to pave the way for similar struggles to make big business pay their fair share. We've also been building the nationwide rent strike 2020 movement with many of our members playing a role in organizing their own buildings and supporting tenant struggles. We've been organizing in our unions um, like Tyler is, 
um, and fighting alongside workers across the country, from healthcare and grocery workers to those in Amazon's warehouses, helping to build towards workplace workplace actions on May Day and staging so social distance protests when possible. All the while, we're doing everything we can to report on these struggles and put forward socialist ideas when they're needed now more than ever. We've had to invest in digital organizing tools and we need to keep funding our full-time organizers and our publications. To fight for independent working class politics, we've never relied on assent from corporations. But we can't do this work without money and without resources. The ruling class has virtually no limits to what they can spend to sideline and silence us, but we refuse to back down. To help us continue to fight for a socialist future, please donate to Socialist Alternative if you're able. If you're still working, consider donating a portion of your stimulus check. Even a small contribution helps to sustain our working class organization, just as small contributions ran Bernie Sanders' campaign. As Rebecca mentioned earlier, Socialist Alternative is also an organization that you can join. Um, so we can try and post that link again as well so that you can get devo uh, involved directly with our organization. What scares the capitalist class more than Bernie Sanders is a united movement of workers and young people consciously organizing for real democratic control over our economy and society. We refuse to die for Wall Street and we refuse to let up the struggle. The corporate elite and their bought politicians wouldn't put so much effort into sabotaging these efforts if they didn't represent uh, the potential to be a real force of change. Another world is not only possible, but absolutely necessary. So thanks again so much to our panelists, to everyone who tuned in tonight, and for your commitment to building this movement. Solidarity.